at this lecture we're going to discuss the physiology of the exocrine portion of the pancreas and also part of the pancreas that secretes um, uh, secretions through a duct and not directly into the bloodstream. So functionally the pancreas is divided into the endocrine and the exocrine glands. We're only focusing on the exocrine glands for this lecture. And the exocrine portion of the pancreas is a compound alveolar gland. Uh, it's got alveoli and those all sacs, and once we fill the stuff, it's filled with zymogen granules, and these granules are filled with digestive enzymes. And what happens is that these zymogens are released through exocytosis, um, so they migrate from inside the cell to the cell membrane and then release their, um, um, their products into the lumens of the pancreat pancreatic ductules and these ductules coalesce into a single duct the duct of Wurzung and the duct of Wurzung joins the common bile duct at the ampulla of water the ampulla of water is encircled by the sphincter of Odi which controls whether it's open or not and on occasion you may some uh, individuals may have an accessory pancreatic duct uh, which enters the duodenum more proximally Okay, so let's talk about the juice uh, that the pancreas makes. Um, so once food enters from the stomach into our duodenum and our jejunum, that food is soaked in stomach acid. Uh, when that acid enters the duodenum, uh, the duodenum and the jejunum start secreting hormones called secretin and cholecystokinin, uh, which we'll go into a little bit more detail in the next few slides. And then the pancreatic juice is secreted and pancreatic juice consists of a mixture of water, sodium, potassium, a heck of a lot of bicarbonate that makes the pancreatic juice alkaline, uh, some digestive enzymes and some bile from the common bile duct which we're not going to go into detail uh, for the purposes of this lecture. So all that uh, bicarbonate then neutralizes the acid coming in from the stomach. And about uh, one and a half liters of that is secreted every day so if you're working in ICU and uh, you need to start calculating fluid balance and that sort of thing, you might spare thought for the fluid that you're losing via your pancreatic juice. And uh, as mentioned, there are digestive enzymes um, and uh, these guys uh, are generally pro-enzymes initially and they have to be converted into active enzymes within the duodenum and these pro-enzymes consist of trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, pyrolastase and pyrocarboxypeptidase uh, amongst others and there are other enzymes as well uh, such as amylase and lipase and uh, the nucleases and probably quite a few enzymes that we haven't even yet discovered yet. Okay, so we're going to focus on those um, protein-splitting pro-enzymes because um, we know happen to know a lot about them and there's a bit of a cascade effect. Uh, we're going to first focus on trypsinogen and what happens is that once trypsinogen enters into the duodenum, the duodenum secretes um, enteropeptidase, also known as enterokinase, and that converts trypsinogen into its active form, trypsin. Um, and just as a side note, enteropeptidase is a combination of a polysaccharide of a protein. It's about 41% polysaccharide. Trypsin is a protein splitting molecule, so hypothetically trypsin should digest this guy because he's, uh, he's a protein molecule. But because it has polysaccharide content, it helps to pre uh, prevent it from being immediately digested by the proteins it activates. So hopefully it will last long enough to activate a true few trypsinogen molecules before it's eventually auto-digested. And then trypsin in and of itself is capable of activating a, a trypsinogen and this is we then have this so-called autolytic chain reaction whereby trypsin trypsinogen converted into trypsin um, will then allow a trypsin to um, split trypsinogen back into an active form of trypsin and so on and so forth into a chain reaction. Now, hypothetically, um, if you by accident activate some trypsin in your pancreas, uh, that would lead into a hectic sort of chain reaction within your very pancreas itself, and the pancreas could easily digest itself uh, through the power of uh, 
trypsin. If you have just one molecule of trypsin, you could then have that cascade chain reaction, uh, eventually leading to destruction of your pancreas. And uh, in order to prevent this sort of thing, the pancreas secretes trypsin inhibitor molecules uh, within itself in case that uh, sort of accidental chain reaction starts. So trypsin also has other effects um, besides uh, breaking down proteins and activating trypsinogen. Trypsin, uh, trypsin can also activate phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2 is an enzyme that splits fatty acids of lecithin and that makes lysolecithin. And lysolecithin is known to combine the cell membranes and damage cell membranes and cause cell necrosis. And it thought, it's thought that it might be a contributing factor in pancreatitis. So in pancreatitis, your zymogen granules are leaky, and some of that trypsin might actually leak out um, and actually start digesting the pancreas to cause pancreatitis. And uh, not only that, by activating phospholipase A2, there's further damage caused by this lysolecithin. Um, but in terms of sort of duodenal function, trypsin also activates all these other proenzymes, chymotrypsinogen, proelastase, and procarboxypeptidase. So just to give you um, a flow diagram to explain it by in a way that might be easier to un uh, understand, we have trypsinogen sent into our duodenum. Uh, the duodenum uh, secretes enteropeptidase or enterokinase to convert that into trypsin. Trypsin in and of itself will then start splitting trypsinogen to make more trypsin. And then trypsin will then activate chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, proelastase into elastase, and procarboxypeptidase into carboxypeptidase. Of course, those are not the only uh, pancreatic enzymes. There are other pancreatic enzymes. Um, we have nucleases, which break down nucleic acids to nucleotides. We have amylase, which is also secreted um, in our saliva. Uh, the pancreas also uh, secretes it directly into the duodenum to break down starch. And we have lipase, which breaks down uh, lipids. And when we have uh, acute pancreatitis, pancreatitis, these enzymes especially will leak into our bloodstreams. And then we can detect, we can clin uh, biochemically detect pancreatitis by measuring amylase and lipase. And, and uh, if you have abdominal pain, if a raised amylase and a raised lipase, you need to think, oh, we've got pancreatitis. And just as an aside, because I've seen so many young doctors make really stupid mistakes when it comes to um, abdominal pain, and generally it's the doctors who are fresh out of community service. Um, because no one's there to supervise you in community service and you generally pick up very bad habits and make stupid mistakes that you take over into private practice and then you eventually end up in medical legal hot water. As a rule of thumb, any severe abdominal pain is due to one of these three causes until proven otherwise. Pregnancy, diabetic acidosis, and pancreatitis. And I've heard of many cases of Doctors fresh out of community service, sending back abdominal pains, uh, when, uh, which actually were ectopic pregnancies because it didn't, they didn't think about the possibility of pregnancy. And when I was an intern at Kalafong Hospital, we had about two or three patients referred to us with supposed acute appendicitis, when in fact um, they were actually ectopic pregnancies. In fact, the one uh, surgeon I was working under took a patient to theatre because uh, he assumed that the casualty officer had ruled out pregnancy. He opened the patient up and he saw an ectopic pregnancy and then he was very, very ticked off with the casualty officer. But even senior uh, guys um, uh, as, uh, will make, will can make this mistake because uh, I was a senior casualty officer that referred the patient to us. So even senior guys miss pregnancy. So uh, any severe abdominal pain is, pregnant, is due to pregnancy until proven. Otherwise, very easy to test with a urine uh, pregnancy test. So you really have no excuse for missing this. If you miss this, you are in very much medical legal hot water. And uh, please stop referring patients with ectopic pregnancies to the surgery guys if you ever work in an emergency medicine unit. Very easy to test, very easy to miss. Um, please don't make that mistake. The other thing is uh, often diffuse sort of vaguely localized abdominal pain can be caused by hyperglycemia and we're entering sort of a stage in the evolution of society where people are stuffing themselves with carbohydrate rich diets and there are many people walking around undiagnosed diabetes and sometimes they'll present uh, as a sort of first sort of 
presentation of the diabetes that will present to your unit with uh, stomach pains due to um, early diabetic ketoacidosis. That's also very easy to test at the bedside with a finger prick uh, blood test. Uh, please, this is also a stupid thing to miss. Uh, don't send a patient with early diabetic ketoacidosis diagnosis of gastroenteritis. And then thirdly, a real sort of surgical cause, um, or sort of surgical cause is pancreatitis. Whenever you do a blood workup for an abdominal pain, um, always consider doing lipase and amylase to check for pancreatitis. It's um, very uh, sort of lame to refer a patient with an acute abdomen to a surgeon um, uh, with, uh, and having not sort of gone through the final steps of making that diagnosis of pancreatitis. Uh, if you are going to do blood tests for uh, acute abdomen, always remember to put your pancreas enzymes in because your pancreas enzymes will sometimes start going up before your CRP and your inflammatory markers go up and um, you might send a patient home with pancreatitis because the FBC and the CRP are still normal uh, because it didn't occur to you to test those um, lipase and amylase levels which have actually already started uh, to rise. So these are three sort of common uh, mistakes uh, that are made by young doctors and missing the, the diagnosis of um, acute abdominal pain. Um, make it a habit that any severe abdominal pain is due to one of these three until proven otherwise, pregnancy, diabetic acidosis, pancreatitis, and then you can start looking uh, for other sort of uh, surgical causes, please. Okay, so let's talk about the regulation of pancreatic uh, juice. Uh, pancreatic juice secretion is regulated through secretin, cholecystokine, and acetylcholine. Secretin works on the pancreatic duct cells via cyclic AMP. And if cyclic AMP forces those cells to work harder to secrete more uh, pancreatic juice. Um, however, the zymogen granules remain intact more or less, so you have a lot of um, alkaline juice with very little enzymes. Secretin also stimulates bile ducts. Cholecystokinin, on the other hand, from the duodenum, acts on the acinal cells uh, of the exocrine portion of the pancreas, and it works via phospholipase C. So phospholipase starts uh, breaking up those granules, and those granules release their enzymes into the pancreatic duct. Uh, if you had to give cholecystokinin without giving secretin, you're going to have a small amount um, of juice, um, but it will be enzyme rich. And acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system also works on phospholipase C and also stimulates the discharge of zymogen granules, which is why simply the sight of food or simply thinking about food um, will uh, stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and via acetylcholine you will already start um, being prepared uh, or preparing pancreatic juice uh, for that food, even though you're not actively eating yet. And of course, remember when you're swallowing, uh, that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, and also as the food bolus goes down uh, and the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, um, there's also going to be paras reflex parasympathetic stimulation of the pancreas. Uh, through our acetylcholine, we're going to have more pancreatic juice. And these are my references.